به وقتی که اعتماد من از ریسمان سوست ادالت عویزان بود و در تمام شهر قلب چراغ های مراتی که تکیه می کردند وقتی که چشم های کودکانه عشق مرا و دستمال تیره قانون می بستند و از شقیقه های مسترب ارزوی من پاباره های خون بی بیرون می باشید وقتی که زندگی من دیگر چیزی نبود هیچ چیز به جز تیک تاک ساعت دیواری دریافتم باید 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 دیوانوار دوست بیدارم یک پنجره برای من کافی است Welcome everyone. My name is Asad Ahmed and I am professor of Arabic and Islamic studies and the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Many, many years ago, someone very dear to my heart introduced me to the great Farooq Zad's short documentary experimental film called Khane Seyaf Asp, The House is Black a poetic reflection on a leper colony, surreal and haunting in its imagery. It compassionately offers flashes of a people confined to the darkness of a place that rests away their humanity. Those scenes of the controlled, ostracized and disempowered are etched in my memory. And I have recently returned to that refrain. And I realize how that peace stands as a profound metaphor for more pervasive and oppressive darkness. And how many Farooq Zads there are in the front lines, their lamps lit, leading the way through the darkness for all of us. I'm not a scholar of contemporary Iran and I have little to offer other than my frustration and anger, my sense of solidarity and my confession of disorientation. And this disorientation for me It is especially pronounced in my capacity as a historian of Islam and the Middle East, and as someone who grew up, studied, lived, and traveled in Muslim-majority countries. There is a historical dissonance and a dissonance of personal experience that I cannot explain. But what I can hope for is that this teaching is a contribution to the resistance, however fractional and incremental it may be, to institutions and systems that perpetuate the darkness. And all one needs is a sliver of light through the window to brighten our hopes and to remind us of the strength of our audacious solidarity and of our love. Yak panjore baraye ma kafi est, bayad diwane war war dost bidarim. In our midst today are some exceptional scholars who can take the conversation forward in meaningful ways. My privilege beyond welcoming you is to introduce you to my eminent colleague, Professor Mino Muallam, who will moderate the conversation. Professor Muallam is one of the leading scholars of her generation in the field of women and gender studies and of modern and contemporary Iran. She received her MA and BA from the University of Tehran and her PhD from the Université de Montréal in Canada. Currently, she's Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Berkeley, where she also served as the Chair of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. She's the author of numerous works and the recipient of many awards, most of which we simply do not have time to mention on this occasion, but I highlight some of her books. Persian Carpets, The Nation as a Transregional Commodity, published by Routledge in 2018. Between Warrior Brother and Veiled Sister, Islamic Fundamentalism and the Cultural Politics of Patriarchy in Iran, published in 2005 by the University of California Press, and her co-editorship of the book Between Woman and Nation, Nationalisms, Transregional Feminisms, and the State, published by Duke University Press in 1999. I'm indeed very proud and inspired to be her colleague at Berkeley. Mino, thank you for partnering with the CMES and taking the lead on this important event. I now yield the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Asad Ahmad, for your kind and generous introduction. 
and for sharing the beautiful poem by Farooq Farrokhzad, who seems to be staying relevant to various uh, times and spaces. So let me uh, thank Professor Asad Ahmad for supporting this event. I'm also grateful to Nathan Spanis for at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, who worked very hard on the organization of this panel. I also wish to thank Daniel Khanna for his help with the Zoom today. I uh, need also to thank the Gender and Women's Studies and Media Studies Program at UC Berkeley and Women and Gender Studies and Middle East and South Asia Studies at UC Davis for co-sponsoring this event and supporting it. Uh, also, many thanks to our panelists who accepted my invitation on short notice and our audiences for being with us today. As for the structure of the panel, after the introductions and in the first round, I will ask each panelist to enter the world of representation of the Iranian women's protest, which led to the tragic death of Mahsa Amini from their own feminist scholarly and personal position, positions. Given that this protest cannot be separated from many years of feminist and womanist activism and scholarship, both in Iran and in the diaspora, I prepared a specific question for each panelist based on their areas of scholarship so we could delve into a deeper understanding of Iranian women's protest for social justice in the second round. I should also mention that because of internet instability and censorship in Iran, we could not invite any of our colleagues from Iran, sadly. Before we start, I should mention that as a transnational and anti-colonial feminist, I believe that we must contextualize women's protests and their claim to the politics of life, considering two factors. One is that the anti-patriarchal, anti-imperialist women's movements for social justice and their demand for the reinvestment in the life of women and other minoritized communities is not limited to Iran, and it's happening in different parts of the world, including the US. Also, there is not only the need to challenge the Iranian state violence and censorship towards recent protests, but question the role of media that are using Iranian women's bodies to spectacularize, militarize, and mobilize support for an imperialist intervention in Iran. As a scholars, I believe we must create lots of space for nuanced and a complex analysis since thinking about women and the politics of life to develop potential feminist futurity cannot be set by Iranophobic and Islamophobic media in the West, but requires lots of thinking and discussion and a change of ideas in academic and non-academic ventures, venues. Let me stop here and without further ado, introduce our panelists and invite them to present their first round of comments for about five to 10 minutes. After the introduction, if you don't mind, I will call the panelists with your first name. Also, for the audience, you can post your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and we make sure to respond to some of your questions during Q&A. Let me start by uh, Nazanine Shahrukhi. Nazanin is a sociologist and an assistant professor of gender and globalization at the London School of Economics, where she directs the MS program for gender, uh, gender research. Her scholarly work is located at the intersection of gender and globalization, feminist geography, gender politics, and ethnographies of the state in Iran, the Middle East, and beyond. Nazanin is the author of the award-winning book, Women in Place, The Politics of Gender Segregation in Iran, which was published by UC Press in 2020. She also serves as the executive committee of the International Sociological Association. 
Our second speaker is Seema Shakhsari, who is an associate professor and the co-chair of the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, and an affiliate of, South, of the Asia and Middle East Studies and the Interdisciplinary Center for Global Change at the University of Minnesota. They are the author of Politics of Rightful Killing, Gender, Sexuality, and Civil Society in Weblogistan, which was published by Duke in 2020, as well as many articles in several edited books and journals, including Feminist Review, International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Sexualities, and many others. Uh, our third speaker is Arzu, Arzu Sanlu, who is a professor in the Department of Law, Societies, and Justice, and the director of the Middle East Center at the University of Washington. Arzu is a legal anthropologist and previously worked as an immigration and asylum attorney. Arzu's least research and teaching explored the intersection of law and cultural practices, especially with respect to human rights. She is the author of Forgiveness Work, Mercy, Law, and Victims Rights in Iran, which was published by Princeton in 2020 which won the Law and Society Association's Herbert Jacob Book Prize for New Outstanding Work in Law and Society Scholarship, as well as the Musabare Rahmani Book Prize for Best Scholarly Monograph um, in Iranian and Persian Studies. Arzu is also the author of The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran, published by Princeton in 2009, which analyzes the politicization of women's rights talk there. She is also the co-editor of a volume which is called Care in, the, in a Time of Humanitarianism, the stories of refugee aid and despair in the global south. And our fourth speaker is uh, Roxana Bahramitash, who earned her PhD at McGill Sociology Department and pursued a career in academia, teaching at McGill and Concordia Universities and publishing many academic books and articles on gender and development. She has won many awards and her second postdoc was selected by the Canadian Parliament as one of the top three research in Canada. Alongside academia, Bahramitash has worked with several international organizations. Her current project is focused on creative nonfiction for which she has recently received her second grant from the Canada Council for the Arts. And fifth, and our last speaker is Wendy D'Souza, who is an adjunct lecturer in the Middle East South Asia program at UC Davis where she teaches modern Iranian history and women and gender in Iran. Her book entitled Unveiling Men, Modern Masculinities in 20th Century Iran dealt with the formation of modern masculinity and how secular discourses shaped modern manhood. The Suza's current book project is a monograph on African slavery in Iran and the Persian Gulf particularly around issues of race, gender, and sexual violence. Please welcome our speakers. I want to welcome our speakers, and uh, uh, you can start one after another. And once your first round, round of conversation interventions is done, then I'll ask each of you my specific questions. And after that, we can open the panel to Q&A. We start with um, Nazani. Thank you very much, uh, Minu John, if I may. Um, thanks for bringing us all together and thanks for letting me go first. It's uh, almost 1 a.m. here in London. So um, it's, it's great to be in conversation with everybody. I've written my part so that I could be fast. Um, what we've witnessed in Iran in the past month is a jaded society shaking off its weariness and taking to the streets, creating spaces, however fleetingly, where it could voice and act grievances and hopes. It is an unprecedented and in many ways unique episode. Part of the uniqueness of these protests has been the quantity and quality of women's presence in them. 
women have participated in large numbers and actually they have led and invested the protests with their own vitality and voices. It is true that women have been active and present in past protest movements from those that led to the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979 to those of today. But despite their visibility, women's issues were never part of the agenda, were, were never made it to the revolutionary agenda. Women's liberation was um, uh, often relegated to an afterthought and postponed to a later time after society was to be freed and democracy established. What is new in these protests then is that they are both feminized in the sense of the bodies that are in the protest, um, the increasing number of women in it, and feminist or rather marked by a feminist undertone as evident in the um, slogan, women, life, freedom, and also many of the demands that are being shared. Yet my optimism about the feminist content of the protest is laced with a dose of caution as it is too early to draw definitive conclusions. In a way we can see with some clarity what women are breaking away from um, the state as a symbol and locus of patriarchy, but we cannot yet discern what they're running towards. But perhaps um, the destination is precisely actively shaped through this process and the tensions and contentions it entails. Now, the second point I want to raise um, uh, is that uh, many have characterized the protest as an iconic moment. I don't dispute this, but as I've written elsewhere, we should be wary of one of the potential side effects of iconization, the erasure of, past, of, uh, of rich pasts by the glow of the present. Every protest has its history and um, these recent protests too follow a long tradition of claim making and women's activism with notable successes and failures um, in post-revolutionary Iran. In the early um, uh, Islamic Republic, women pursued change through concessions. They went to great lengths to lay claims. And I'm here just giving a sketch and a mapping of the dominant mode of engagement with the state or disengagement from it. Otherwise, from day one after the establishment of the Islamic Republic, we've had women uh, publicly uh, uh, opposing the state and defying the state. So I'm just talking about what I consider to be the dominant mode in each um, era. So in the initial years, they went to women, uh, women activists went to great lengths to lay claims that did not threaten, threaten the Islamic Republic and to adopt discourses circumscribed and sanctioned by the state. So, you know, um, they laid claim on different spaces in the city, for example, as revolutionary sisters, or as martyrs' wives, Zanone Shahid, Zanone Shohada. Um, as women's activism evolved and the state developed too, women's movements discerned opportunities to work selectively with particular state institutions, especially during the reform-minded administrations between 1997 and 2005, and particularly during the sixth uh, majlis or parliament when the women's caucus was um, launched and established. Frustration with the pace of change during the reform and later the defeat of reformist factions led to new forms of activism informed by mistrust towards the state and prompted women's movements activists to bypass the state, for example, when they reached out to FIFA to, um, to gain access to um, uh, sports stadiums and eventually turn away from it. After the Green Movement in 2009, with the further securitization of women's issues and frequent arrests, the state dissolved already existing organizations and prevented new ones to sprout, effectively reducing the flame of women's activism to a bare flickering. It is in this context that these protests and their feminist elements are situated. They lack a memory of a struggle embodied in institutional continuity, as well as experience with organization building and teamwork. Paradoxically, this has also been the key to their relative resilience as the lack of easily discernible organizational structures and their leaderless character has created a challenge for the state. And now my final point, what do Iranian women want? I'd like to start answering this question by first complicating how we understand or see Iranian women. During the recent protests, different sets of demands have been expressed. The most prominent among them being an end to, systemic, uh, to the systemic state violence and humiliation, as e-coding calls for the removal of mandatory veiling, the right to bodily autonomy, and the right to a dignified life. Now, going back to the title of this roundtable, The Politics of Life, 
What this dignified life entails varies across geographical, societal, and political boundaries. Women's bodies are not merely uh, gendered, they are classed, ethnicized, localized, structured by center periphery differentials, and this gives rise to different needs with different urgency and intensity, different constraints, perils, and potentialities. This is so eloquently articulated in a statement by a group of Baluchi women that highlighted their subjection to multiple structures of violence, that of the central state, religious establishment, both local Sunni establishments, but also the central Shia establishment, tribal and family structures and labor structures in a deprived, highly securitized region marked by dearth of infrastructure. Thus the word women can distract us from the complex geometries of power that guide their being and implicate them in the state differently and the multiplicity of voices these generate. I cannot emphasize enough my use of the plural. The women that came out in the streets to protest have voices and not one voice. We usually hear the, the notion, the voice of the Iranian people. And these voices reflect the multiple experiences I just mentioned. A related point, and I'm gonna end there, uh, uh, that I think need to, we need to bear in mind is the multifacetedness of the protest extends beyond the streets. First of all, not everyone is in the streets. Second, protests or mini revolutions, if you will, are happening in everyday sites and spaces and will continue like that. Discussions inside homes, among friends, in workplaces, on the buses, in taxis, Focus on militant feminist activism cannot alone give us an accurate understanding of the events that have transpired. The protest might be less militant than some expect or hope, but wider in scope and perhaps more effective than some assume. I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Many thanks, Nazani Jan. Wonderful, thank you so much. And our second speaker is Sima. Sima is uh, yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mina Jan. I um, really appreciate your invitation. And uh, thank you, Wendy, um, Asad, uh, Nathan, and Daniel, uh, CMES and uh, Gender Women's Sexuality Studies at UC Berkeley, and also UC Davis for organizing uh, this event. And also uh, the panelists. Uh, it's truly an honor to be in conversation with all of you and with um, the audience. Thanks to the audience for joining us as well. Um, I would like to start with acknowledging that I live in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, which is the current and ancestral land of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. Uh, I live and work in a land where many indigenous people live and where um, the spirits of thousands of indigenous people who were killed by the US settler colonial state uh, haunts um, uh, this land every day. And I uh, live in the Twin Cities also where George Floyd, Dante uh, Wright, and many, uh, many other black people were killed by the racist US police. I also want to remember Massa or Gina Amini who died on September 16 while at the custody of the Iranian guidance patrol um, and also those who have been killed since uh, Massa's death at the hands of the Iranian security forces. Um, and speaking of those who have died due to violence, I also want to remember my sister, Mojgan Shahzari. Uh, tomorrow is Mojgan's seventh year of uh, anniversary of passing. Um, she died of breast cancer in Iran and suffered the consequences of the deadly sanctions that have been killing Iranians slowly for uh, many years now. Um, and I entered this conversation tonight this way, uh, this evening, not to be morbid, but because I want to honor the memory of those who have lost their lives unjustly to violence, be the violence of settler colonialism, um, racism, sanctions, uh, wars, state violence. Um, and also I want to emphasize that the politics of life, which is uh, in the title of this panel, uh, and politics of um, death uh, need to be thought about in a transnational context where the cultivation of the life of one population is often um, is often contingent um, on the death and debilitation of others. And I'm uh, also, of course, thinking of the Israeli uh, settler attacks in uh, Nablus uh, under the protection of Israeli military forces, uh, which has left 
many people maimed and injured in the uh, recent weeks. So this transnational approach that I'm using, of course, you know, Aminu is my mentor and she's to blame for this approach that I take. Um, uh, you know, it, it's really important to think about relations of power within this approach and also uh, possibilities of solidarity and also um, uh, you know, what transnational feminist scholars such as Elo Shohad and others have called a relational approach. Um, and also a queer, um, uh, you know, radical queer approach, which uh, focuses on multi-issue approach rather than just focusing on um, struggles or relations of power as separate from each other. Um, so I see the demands of the Iranian protesters as connected to demands of indigenous sovereignty, racial justice and gender justice in the US and also anti-occupation and um, anti-colonial projects around the world. So uh, with that opening, let me just say a few words about um, the anti-compulsory hijab protests, which are beyond um, the hijab at this point. Um, the protests um, are, of course, as many have argued, the explosion of anger and resentment that has built up for 43 years, um, uh, where the Iranian revolution happened and the post-revolutionary state promised uh, uh, something unlike the Pahlavi dictatorship. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the Iranian state promised economic prosperity for all and not just for a selected few who exploited the working class and the farmers during Shah's regime, uh, independence from the West and the East, as a flood, and also uh, freedoms. And the freedom was mainly from the, uh, you know, uh, obedience to the West and also the, the kind of independence um, to American imperialism. Um, and, but after 43 years, notions of um, economic justice uh, in particular, and also social freedoms have not been delivered. Um, uh, this is not to say that women have only been oppressed or oppress only uh, victims in post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, of course, Iranian women have gained major achievements in the realm of education, cultural participation and productions, and uh, they have been political actors. And I, I'm hoping that Arzu and Roxana Know, whose work is uh, on women's legal and economic um, uh, achievements, we'll talk about those. Um, but uh, there is this kind of nostalgic, um, you know, remembrance of pre-revolutionary Iran in social media where pictures of women in miniskirts on fashion magazines is circulating uh, as a sign of social freedoms in Shah's era. Um, and these kinds of nostalgic uh, remembrances really don't have any kind of uh, economic analysis. They ignore the vast economic disparities um, during Shah's uh, uh, regime. And also there's an amnesia about repression and lack of uh, political freedom during um, the Pahlavi regime where there were so many political prisoners, uh, where there was censorship and of course uh, women's rights were only sanctioned through the one state party of Hezbollah uh, Sochis and also the, you know, the uh, uh, women's rights, uh, or I should say two <laughs> groups appointed by Shah. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to move beyond that kind of juxtaposition of freedom and then going back to um, tradition and so on and so forth. Uh, as Minu, uh, of course, has uh, argued the Iranian revolution of 1979 was actually a product of modernity and um, uh, so on and so forth. So I won't uh, go to uh, those and I'm hoping that we will talk about that um, uh, if necessary in the uh, Q&A. But the protests against compulsory hijab are neither new, um, as Nazanin um, uh, uh, alluded, nor are they only about hijab. They're connected to a long history of women's activism and scholarship in Iran. They're also connected to um, you know, the grievances around uh, economic justice, environmental justice, and uh, most uh, Iranian people are angry when they see a select few what they call Aghazadehs enjoy luxury apartments in Tehran or outside of Iran, while the majority of the Iranian population is suffering economically. And we have to take that into consideration rather than reducing the protests just to hijab. 
Um, and uh, I, I promise this is my last point. I, um, you know, this brings me to sanctions because, uh, and I know that everyone is talking about different issues. So I want to focus on sanctions. I just published something in Truth Out about how a woman life freedom is not possible really unless uh, the sanctions are, are lifted. Um, sanctions have had a huge role in the economic devastation of the Iranian people. Um, as some of you might know, I'm a part of the No Sanctions on Iran uh, campaign that we started, just a few of us. Uh, and we have been saying this um, along with many scholars and activists that sanctions do not hurt the elites or the state, but the most vulnerable segments of the population, including women, especially working women, trans women who are uh, already marginalized, uh, Afghan refugees, houseless people, Kudak on a car, um, houseless children, uh, people in impoverished provinces, such as Sistan and Baluchistan, uh, such as Kurdish provinces and Khuzestan. Um, and the fact is that, um, and we saw this in Iraq too, that sanctions push ordinary people into poverty and provide the opportunity for corruption and sanctions pro uh, profiteering. Um, sanctions along with the accelerated privatization of the Iranian economy, in particular in recent year, uh, years, have meant that the economic gaps, uh, the economic gap between the wealthy and uh, those who don't have uh, really resources, uh, has increased more than ever before. Um, and sanctions uh, give the Iranian state also the ammunition to suppress any kind of dissent, uh, because as uh, we have argued in uh, No Sanctions on Iran, sanctions are war by another name. Um, and under warlike conditions, as many feminists have argued, uh, there, uh, there, there are nationalist mobilizations against the foreign enemy. And of course, women become the ones who suffer the most uh, in war um, conditions. Uh, and of course, the notion of national security is deployed over and over to suppress the protests in Iran. Um, uh, because people are uh, accused of foreign collusion or foreign propaganda. So the legitimate grievances of Iranian protesters are suppressed under um, the rhetoric of national uh, security. Um, and, you know, we saw this when uh, there were uh, recently teachers and workers protests against privatization of education in Iran uh, with environmental activists. And of course, there's a lot of hijacking of all these movements that often happens uh, by um, uh, some uh, interest groups, opposition groups, uh, and of course, State of Israel uh, is adamantly against the lifting of the sanctions. And I am hoping that in the Q&A, uh, we can talk more about that. And of course, uh, you know, we see imprisonment of activists, journalists, artists, scholars, and political figures um, uh, in Iran in the name of foreign collusion, exactly because uh, of how sanctions are used as a way to say, look, we are under sanctions, we are under pressure, and you are threatening national security. Um, and so, um, you know, the uh, 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 there is basically the way that economics, uh, that um, deadly sanctions also hurt the protests rather than uh, helping them. Uh, I uh, I think I must be out of time, Minujan. Am I? Uh, do I have a minute, or am I totally out of time? You can maybe you can uh, keep that for the question when I ask. Yeah. Questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Sima John, for your wonderful comments. And now uh, it's Aruzu's uh, turn. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm always, okay, good. Um, and I too want to uh, thank all the uh, organizers. I want to thank uh, Minu John and my panelists and all the audience. And I look forward to a discussion. Um, I just, when I, when I think about what's happening in Iran, I think I want to give context um, and to give context to these bold protests for women's rights in Iran, we might return to the revolutionary era and the promises afforded in the discourses that sought to elevate women's status. That is the emphasis on women's status and their expectation of better treatment in the post revolutionary era was of a piece with Khomeini's designation of women as central to the broader aims of the Hukumate Islami, Islamic government. 
And as such, since that period in which women themselves played important roles, women's issues have gained a permanent foothold in the state as their concerns became part of the broader issues of social justice affecting the entire nation and its revolutionary aim to create a more just society. When I started my graduate work in anthropology, I did so after reading about the situation of women in Iran just after the revolution. Much of the scholarship initially noted that women had no rights or they lost all their rights. And others later noted that women did have rights, but they were being construed through Islam. So my project, I set about to better understand how in post-revolutionary Iran, women understood their rights. Um, so in all of my years of sitting in lawyers' offices, mostly in Tehran, the most remarkable aspect of the setting for me was just how unremarkable it was from the standpoint of a lawyer. I mean, this was underscored for me just weeks into my first trip to Iran in 1999. At that time, I entered the office of a very well-known uh, lawyer who had been practicing law for almost 30 years. So her career spanned the period before and after the revolution. So armed with my knowledge from scholarly books and articles on women in Iran, I quickly got to the point and I said, I'm interested in how women in Iran are seeking their rights through Islam. Without missing a beat, the lawyer responded, well, I can't help you. Here we have civil codes and civil courts. This is a law office and I'm a lawyer. I don't deal in Islam, I deal in the law. If you wanna understand women's rights, you need to learn how the law works. You need to go to the courts and you need to see for yourself how women are getting their rights. I was surprised by this response that told me it was civil law and procedure and not some generalized platitudes about respect for women through which women were seeking redress for grievances. Indeed, this attention to legal process became a central focus of my research from there on. It wasn't just about learning how disputes are resolved. It was about the politics of rights and the operations of power and gender relations and especially about subject formation in Iran. Many know that during the 1979 revolution, leaders sought to challenge Iran's emulation of Western societies. Um, and they aimed to turn the country to some authentic cultural values. And this struck a chord with a broad cross-section of the population. So many groups came together to overthrow a monarch and establish a representative government through what ultimately became an Islamic Republic. This was a compromise, the effects of which continue to be seen today. Among those effects was the politicization of rights talk by state and non-state actors. And by politicization, I'm referring to the critique of the language of rights made by numerous revolutionary forces at the time for being indicative of the ills of Western individualism when the basis of a healthy society should be the family and women as the or the crowning jewel of the family would be its focus. And individuals needs were to yield to these broader social concerns. So rights talk or talking in terms of rights in this context became a verbal index for a sense of entitlement without responsibility. So in 1979, revolutionary actors mobilized images of Iranian women dressed in black chadors as symbolic foils to these individuated Western women who were objectified, commodified, and thus unemancipated. In the uh, 1983 Veiling Act, when it was legislated, it was legislated in tandem with the discourse of rehabilitating Iranian women and restoring them to a place of respect. The chador was symbolic, not just of renewed status of the Iranian women, but also of a collective shift in Iran, born by women, of course, toward a religio-national idea of Iran that represented the triumph of the revolution over Western values. Now, many of you are familiar with this story and my aim is not just to simply repeat this. Instead, I want to think about the significance of the promise 
to improve women's status as a primary goal of the revolution. By placing women's issues in central focus, the resulting government could now, would now be held accountable for these promises. What's more, as a legitimating factor of the revolution, women's status would now forever be tied to the state's very legitimacy. Now, just what improvement meant or how it was to be achieved would be the substance of struggles yet to come. And one of the earliest instances in which we saw the struggle was, of course, in March 1979, when tens of thousands of women in Iran flooded the streets to protest the suspension of the family protection law that had given women some rights in divorce. Um, they were protesting other, at that time, possible legal setbacks, including mandatory veiling, which did happen, and the revocation of suffrage, which did not. Now to protest these actions, the women fought back and held up signs to make their grievances known and they called for equality, women's rights. In response, they were attacked and dubbed Western puppets. Here was an illustration of some of the fractures within the popular struggle to remove a monarch. Just what was to emerge was as of then uncertain and people were divided. Here we also see the association of a language of rights with Western excess and imperialism. Um, and this is what in part influenced my surprise when the lawyer I met in Iran told me we have civil codes, we have laws and further inspired my interest to find out how the laws operate. Because in those first months in Iran, I was surprised again and again to find that most of my interlocutors many of them pious Muslim women, many of them supportive of the revolution, if not the Islamic Republic itself, far from talking about their you know, status in the Islamic framework, spoke in this renewed rights talk, referencing as their source of rights, not Islam, but the rule of law. So to understand the significance of making rights-based claims today, we need to recall that Khomeini's thesis for Islamic government had no use for a law-making body. There was no need for man-made laws as God's law would only matter and the legislative body was to be dissolved. Um, so it becomes significant that despite this, the Islamic Republic retained not only the legislative branch of government, but also the civil courts as a venue for adjudication and the civil codes as the formal expression of law. So what the lawyer was pointing out to me about civil law was this. All of these factors in the legal system have tangible consequences for a system of rights. And it was all done after Khomeini had nullified and invalidated ostensibly code law. This is important because civil codes and legal procedures carry with them effects, subject making effects. As apparatuses of a republic, the institutions of the state require subjects to operate as rights-bearing individuals, particularly when, re when interacting with those institutions. So one of the consequences of this uneasy union between codification and the shad was in the family codes. Now women were required to go to court to make claims. They were required to make use of this legal scaffolding or initially men weren't. And as the women did, they necessarily had to come and think of themselves as autonomous beings, as bearers of rights. And in order to outline their cases in civil courts, they needed to employ a rights-based understanding of their status, precisely what the revolution had cautioned against. In the end, it was Islam that was made to accommodate the Republican state framework. And as it did, it produced liberal subjects throughout the society. Even if the Islamic Republic made women the grounds on which political disputes over sovereignty were fought, the effects of those disputes were forms that were conspicuously liberal through the nation state form of a republic. And the institutions, oops, I'm almost done. The institutions of the state comprise the tangible apparatus of everyday life and shape sensibilities, affect, subjectivity, and ultimately practice. So it was with this understanding perhaps that the lawyer insisted I go to courts where it was so apparent that women and men 
judges and adversarial parties were discussing their rights and not their status. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Arzu John. And uh, now, Roxana, it's your turn to talk. Um, hello, I first want to thank you, um, Minujan, and uh, the organizers and the participants. Uh, allow me to start uh, with an, a land acknowledgement. Um, I am speaking to you from unceded land of um, Ganyangaha Nation. Uh, the city is Jogja, Montreal host to indigenous as well as uh, settlers. Um, I was um, in speaking about my positionality. Here, I, I wear many hats. Um, you know, John didn't get a, a, I guess she didn't get the link to my books. Um, as an academic, I have published um, many books. Uh, Few of them in, in on Iran. Uh, three of them have been translated into Persian, and I'm just going to name them because I think that will be important to what I have to say. Uh, Gender and Globalization in Southeast Asia has been translated as a university textbook. Um, Veiled Employment, the Political Economy of Women's Employment in Iran, Women's Entrepreneurship in Iran. Uh, and my work has been. Um, mainly focused on uh, women's uh, economic status. Um, I think I was told that we're going to have another round of question, but I don't know, will there be another round of question? Or should I talk about my work? No, anyway. If we have time, we are going to have another round of questions where I'll okay. ask you specific questions about your Okay. Work. So, um, I think that uh, here I am wearing the hat of an academic, uh, and I hope by the time I have, I say whether one good thing is that I'm the last, so some of the thing I wanted to say has already been said. I'm just going to add my um, uh, my contribution. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of panel discussions, but there is, of course, there is a huge um, media. Um, reflection of what's happening. Um, and I have seen a great representation of um, liberal feminist take on currents of events. So here I'd like to emphasize post-colonial feminist theory, and especially uh, under the Western eye of um, Chantra Mahanti, who emphasizes uh, the fact that women are not a homogeneous group. Just as you can't talk about Canadian women because you have indigenous women, you have black women, you have um, women who live on the streets, you have women who are um, sit in the parliament. The same is true in Iran. You have a uh, many different um, category of women uh, with different um, motives that brings them to the streets. I think that um, there's a huge, the, the country it has a very a young population. There is a um, um, huge economic problem and Simo um, made reference to sanctions. Uh, that plays a role, the economy plays a role. Uh, I think that we have been um, focusing a great deal on um, the dark side, let me just say that a lot of people ask, is this a feminist revolution? And I think that what I would like to say is that a feminist revolution has already happened because we have now more than 60% of university graduates are women. Um, the number of women at one point was that uh, we had more female um, film directors in Iran that we have that there is in America. Uh, a, a huge and fundamental change has happened in many different uh, areas. You have female lawyers, female, um, different spheres of intellectuals. Um, so in spite of everything that has happened, uh, women have taken great strides and they have 
achieved a great deal. At the same time, um, we need to remember that uh, the issue is far more complex and complicated than, I mean, often people want to have a black and white. And my role as an academic is to um, look at the nuances. I've done a lot of work as field work uh, in Zahedan. I had I'd done a longitudinal study for two decades, back and forth, and uh, interviewed uh, many different uh, women. And I and at the moment there is a low intensity war in that area because you have um, guns and you have drugs and there are certain other interest groups and you have armed uh, resistance groups, separatist groups that. Uh, shape very much the everyday uh, lives of women, many of whom uh, the issue is not um, veiled. And that takes me to uh, what I will expand later. And that when, when I started my work, I was very interested in um, um, looking at, uh, my work was on gender and development. So I was very interested in uh, women's economic status. At the time, and we're talking about two or three, we're talking about in early 2000, there was a huge literature on um, women's um, civil rights. And we have, um, oh, two minutes, okay, I will, uh, thank you very much. I will wrap it up very quickly. Uh, so we have, um, uh, I will be more speaking about how, um, what brings people on the street is not um, not hijab and not the issues related to civil rights, but more socioeconomic rights. And uh, in that regard, um, there are similarities and differences. There are a lot of, I mean, we are living currently under a huge, we are in the global crisis, and food prices, inflation, uh, it, that's, that is just as, as an added um, element to um, every, every other aspects of women's life that have been affected. Okay, I'll stop here and let... Um, Thank you so speak. much, Roxana John. Thank you everybody for bringing this new insights into our conversation. And uh, now it's Wendy's turn, Wendy is... Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Moalem. Thank you to the CMS organizers for uh, making this happen today and all of you joining on Zoom and this wonderful panel that I get to be a part of. Um, I also want to acknowledge that UC Davis is on stolen Patwin land. Um, and where I am right now in Sonoma County in Northern California, I am uh, on occupied Miwok and Pomo land. So um, I really appreciate SEMA for um, making sure that we're making these acknowledgements. And the great thing about being the fifth speaker is that many of the points uh, you've already covered. So I can make my comments brief um, and I hope to um, do this in honor of Massa Amini. Um, so um, like uh, Dr. Shahsari Sima, I would like to uh, approach this from my background as a historian of gender and sexuality. Um, and I, I know many people who are watching this right now have probably seen already the video on Twitter um, depicting a group of teenagers in uh, Karaj, which is uh, outside of Tehran, uh, shouting Basiji Gomsho or Basiji Get Lost. Um, the representative of Basij, uh, the paramilitary group we mentioned um, earlier, also called the morality police, um, was allegedly sent to the school in order to lecture uh, these school girls on the importance of hijab. And instead of letting him speak, as you can see in the video, they heckled him and forced him to leave the premises. And as he, he left, uh, they were rep repeatedly shouted, be shut off or shameless. Um, the scene of teenage girls boldly shouting be shut off prompted a government functionary to flee. And this says a lot about the current moment. In no small way, they reclaimed moral ground, uh, reversed the power dynamic and shifted the narrative. The death of Mahsa Jina Amini has challenged revolutionary rhetoric and slogans into a new woman-centered critique of uh, patriarchy and power, but as you know, other panelists have mentioned, this has been built on years 
of um, you know, previous uh, feminist efforts and movements. Um, so for those uh, people on this uh, Zoom who may not be familiar with the phenomenon of gender policing, I just wanted to point out exactly what that is and why this isn't really about um, the headscarf. Um, it actually has larger implications for the daily life of women. Um, in order for the ruling elite, such as the Revolutionary Guards and high-ranked government officials, to maintain their social, political, and economic privilege, they deploy the Basij and other bodies of power to do their bidding. They use gender policing as a tool of suppression. This has created an oppressive system, especially for women, but I think we also need to shed a light on the queer community and gender nonconformists in Iran who have borne the brunt of many of these um, uh, surveillance type, type uh, actions. Historically, Iranian women have always been in the vanguard of social change. And I think um, some of you mentioned this already. You know, I, I worked on the 1905 constitutional revolution where uh, women had uh, had revolvers under their chadors marching on parliament demanding um, that the parliament open um, and skillfully organized for universal suffrage while men had debated whether their brains were big enough to deserve equal citizenship. The long durée of state authoritarianism began in 1921 with the rise of Reza Shah, a secular figure who first instituted mandatory Western dress for men and compulsory unveiling for women. He saw ethnic minorities in Iran as vestiges of backwardness and decay and forced them through edict to wear Western clothes and ban their languages in schools. The context for this was a fevered rush to modernize Iran so that it would not be a colony of Russia or Great Britain. And attempts were made to link Iran to a common Aryan or Indo-European heritage. You know, reading history, the Islamic Republic continued this legacy and this fight is not between religion or secularism, which is a lot of what the American media tends to um, depict, but it's about the continue, continue, continuation of compulsoriness through a centralized patriarchy. In this vein, protesters envision a future beyond the secular religious binary, where we hear chants of, and this is more recent, down with the oppressor, be they king or supreme leader, um, it's not hard to see that women's rights activists have to contend not only with colonial effects and internal societal dynamics, but also the legacy of US policy in the region. As Dr. Moalem writes in her book that I highly recommend for everyone, it's a must read, Between Warrior Brother and Veiled Sister, quote, the racist colonialist image of Muslim women as eternal victims, quote, is a well-worn trope that ignores how power relations have been constructed in local, transnational, and geopolitical contexts. As a self-critique, we need to consider how successive US administrations, Republican and Democrat, have directly contributed to the longevity of Iran's authoritarian government. This is especially true with what Sima had mentioned earlier, uh, U.S. unilateral sanctions that make it nearly impossible for people in Iran to get adequate vaccines. And this was particularly difficult um, when uh, during the pandemic when COVID hit. Um, um, medicine like insulin for diabetes um, are, is too expensive. Proper food, people can't afford proper, proper food because of currency devaluation. And things like uh, the proper functioning of planes um, there are many deadly plane crashes in Iran because of a ban on mechanical parts. I'm, I'm sure many Americans aren't even aware of this. Members of the Iranian community are asking us to raise our voices for increased international diplomatic pressure while ending sanctions that harm ordinary people. And I highly recommend, if you have time to please uh, read Dr. Uh, Shah Sadi's article on uh, the effects of sanctions um, on the website, Truthout, and maybe someone can put a link in the chat. Though time will reveal the full sco scope of what is happening today, what seems to have changed in Iran is any belief in reformist politics. Gina's death as a woman who lived at the intersection of ethnic, gender, and class identities, a girl seen as just trying to live her life has galvanized people from all walks of life to envision women's rights as a cornerstone of freedom for everyone. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you all for your wonderful comments and uh, presentation. In the interest of time, I'm going to pose my questions so we leave enough time for Q&A. So some of my questions are longer, some of them are shorter. So let me read my question for each of you and then you could each take a few minutes and respond to those questions. Uh, for Nazanin, you have written a lot about the Iranian state in general and the state's policies on sex segregation. In your book, you argued that there had been two phases in sex segregation policies or two segregation regimes. The first regime, in your view, was based on the state as an agent of prohibition protection. And the, in the second phase, the state became the provider. Going back to your argument, um, do you think the transformation of the segregation regime to its second place has created a crisis for the Islamic Republic, given that women are not treated as citizens of the welfare state rather than moral subjects? In other words, has this shift created a legitimacy crisis for the Islamic Republic and its disciplinary agents such as Gashd Shad or the morality police? My question for Sima is that, as you know, in the past weeks or so, there have been many fascistic, Islamophobic, homophobic, and sexist slogans chanted both in Iran and diaspora and circulated through social and digital media against the clergy in Iran, as well as those journalists, the scholars, the speakers, who have spoken in solidarity with Iranian women protesters, but refuse to identify with an either or position, polarizing legitimate demands of the Iranian women. Even that you have written extensively on the cyberspace and social media, what do you make of the emergence of these forms of violent, sexist and queerophobic language along with fascistic acts of a bomb threat or life threat by some Iranian diasporic or its naturalization by some Iranian opposition or figures as the vulgarity of the 80s generation, the Z generation. As uh, for Arzu, People sometimes ask about the suddenness of this protest against the state violence and injustice. However, you have written about the rise of a cottage industry of people, social workers, activists, lawyers, judges, etc., who work towards greater forgiveness or forbearance in relation to redistributive punishment in Iran, especially your uh, second, your most recent book. Could you say more about this cottage industry and perhaps connected to this protest against the state violence and injustice? Also, at the end of your book, your more, more recent book, you specifically refer to a meeting with ex-political prisoners and how they approach the possibilities for change. Could you elaborate on this meeting and the potentiality for social change in Iran? As for Roxana, you have done a lot of work on Iranian women economic citizenship. How do you think women's protests in the political sphere relate to questions of economic citizenship? As for Wendy, you have written on questions of masculinity in Iran. What do you think of the slogan, Mad Vatan Abadi, Man, Motherland and Prosperity? Could you elaborate on that? So now the, um, you, you can start your responses and then we can open the panel for q &A. I will go first. Thank you. Um, perfect, yeah. thank you, Minuja. Um, so yes, I mean, thank you for this uh, very thoughtful engagement with my book. Um, in the book, I document the shift from regulation, uh, the regulation and the disciplining of women's bodies through prohibition to the regulation and the disciplining of women's bodies through provision, both under the guise of protection, as you mentioned. So first, protecting women's chastity in the early years of the Islamic Republic. Um, uh, as moral subjects, and then to protecting women's bodies as mobile citizens, and these are based on official doc state documents on the buses, on healthy citizens in the parks, and so on and so forth. 
For instance, I examine how the prohibition of women's outdoor exercise, the state's regulation um, of, women, uh, of where women could not go and what they could not do during the 1980s became untenable as many women were defying it. For example, by bypassing the surveillance measures in place, evading the morality police, or by exercising in quiet corners of quiet corners of the green spaces of residential complexes, like um, Ekbatan, for example, in West Tehran. We can call this uh, civil, uh, civil disobedience, if you, if you will, and it has been happening since day one of the Islamic Republic. These acts created what in the book I call a gender boundary crisis, where bodies and behaviors fall outside um, the state-sanctioned uh, gender boundaries, in effect, undermining the state's authority. Thus, what I argue is that instead of insisting on prohibition, the state framed its problem in line with its solution. So it provided women only parks where all previously un, uh, unregulated activity, out, outdoor exercise could take place. In these designated spaces, women could exercise outdoors and without their veils and no one needed to police them um, anymore. As the state extended its reach and jurisdiction into previously unregulated corners of everyday life, it had to engage with more groups and their claims result, resulting in more negotiation, friction and occasionally conflict. On, on an everyday basis. The state was compelled to provide more and respond to demands and expectations, stretching itself too far into everyday life and too thin. And before I'm misunderstood here, I see provision in a um, audience as, as, as a mode of regulation. So I'm not saying gender domination or regulation of women's bodies disappeared. It's just the mode of regulation changed from prohibition to provision. When the state failed to provide, frustration is spread to a wider part of the population. In this sense, the state governed too much and ended up undermining itself, giving rise to what I've called messy governance, the inconsistencies or paradoxes created as the state attempted to govern women's bodies. In a way, it's very similar to what Arzu was also saying about the, um, the legal system and the emergence of kind of these autonomous women who were well-versed in the language of rights. Uh, but I want to take very quickly the example of mandatory veiling. Its imposition has not been driven by a clear methodology. It has not been smooth, has encountered setbacks, and has relied on trial and error. So this can be seen in the changing of the permitted colors, for example, black in the 19, uh, back in the 1980s and early 1990s. The official color palette was restricted to black, navy, brown, and gray. But then later, other brighter colors were added to the palette except for a few, um, uh, few months or a few years, uh, perhaps during the green movement when I was, uh, and after the green movement when I was in Iran, where green uh, unofficially became kind of a, a suspect color as well. Um, another thing is the unevenness of the application. Uh, uh, the messiness can also be seen in the uneven geography and temporality of the enforcement of, of whaling, where and when it is policed as the morality police is not present in all places all the time. And the unevenness of the application of punishment. For many uh, women, this was determined by negotiations by the morality police van. So the, if, if you manage to kind of bargain with the officers that were taking you inside the van, you could kind of um, release yourself inside the, the van, inside the detention center, et cetera. So it really depended on your bargaining skills or the flexibility and leniency of the officers, yes of the officers who had uh, uh, arrested you. Um, um, all these uncertainties, the trial and error experimentations were and still are played out on women's bodies and at the level of the everyday, creating inability to plan, constant fr frustration, friction, the need to constantly second guess, negotiate, argue with state officials and agents. In a way, the state brought this onto itself, as you framed it in your question, this back and forth and continuous attempt to fine tune its projects and the fatigue it has caused has been demystifying and has depleted its ability, the state's ability to ensure hegemony through consent. So to go back to your question, yes, I think the state in its futile attempt to resolve problems, to get out of the mess, the more it sinks um, uh, in the swamp it has created. So I, I do think that that was the cause of that that led to some sort of legitimate crisis. Thank you so much, wonderful comments. And our next speaker is Seema. 
Uh, please just take a few minutes to answer this. Okay, long I'll, I'll try. But can I, in my answer, because your uh, question was about vulgarity and sexist insults, can I repeat those? Um, break the codes of respectability here a little bit uh, that, you know, um, have historically uh, cleansed, uh, you know, the language of women. And um, so I'm, I'm going to actually talk about um, uh, the insults that you mentioned, uh, Minujan, because I see also, I have to say this, I, I'm looking at Q&A and there's an anonymous agitator who's very, very um, disturbed by uh, points that I made about the sanctions and all the questions are about the sanctions. And it's very obvious that um, this issue with the sanctions uh, and uh, the advocacy for the lifting of sanctions is really bothering some people who are making personal attacks and using the exact strategies of the Islamic Republic of accusing people who are against them to be, um, you know, uh, the Islamic Republic accuses people of being uh, foreign um, spies or whatnot. They use the exact same strategy. So I'm going to uh, because there's a question about Negor Mortazavi and why is protest to her talk, um, uh, you know, sexist. I'll ex repeat exactly what was said about uh, uh, Negor to make it clear why these allegations are so sexist and so homophobic uh, and so on and so forth. And the question is who works with Nayak here? I do not work with Nayak. You know, you don't have to. Uh, work with NIAC to be against the sanctions, just to clarify that. I'm sorry to do this, but I, I just, you know, the question, the anonymous is asking a lot of questions <laughs> around sanctions, so just to clarify. So um, uh, uh, the question about basically social media and uh, the sexist language, um, as you know, Minujan, uh, you have read my book. Uh, uh, my book is about Weblogistan and the so-called uh, democratization projects. And one of the questions, not the only question that I ask in the book is why the US has been so invested in social media and so-called inter uh, internet freedom in Iran, while at the same time, it imposed the deadliest sanctions on the Iranian people. 2009, when Obama uh, had the um, uh, deadliest sanctions on the Iranian people uh, uh, through CISADA, uh, that was exactly when the lifting the Iron Curtain and, you know, freeing uh, the Iranian Internet was happening. And this question, you know, to me is the paradox. And what I argue is that the Iranian population lives a lone life, talking about politics of life here, and is subjected to what I call the politics of rightful killing. Uh, that is neither a life that is worth cultivating, as in biopolitics, uh, you know, uh, make live and let die, uh, but it's a life that is apt for democratization through the democratization projects. And there were, there were millions of dollars that were poured into democratization projects in the Middle East in general and in Iran in particular. And Nordis life is a life that is reduced to bare life as Agamben would say, or, you know, Ashima Bembe in necropolitics. So this is somewhere between biopolitics and necropolitics. And through my study of the blog posts of those in diaspora who envisioned a democratic or competed for, um, uh, a democratic future in our presenting the most democratic future in Iran, I showed that many of the diasporic bloggers who had claims of freedom and democracy, and some of whom, many of whom, got funding from Department of State or you know, the uh, Dutch parliament, in fact, repeated heteronormative nationalist narratives, and many were and are extremely homophobic. So, uh, and you know, there's the issue of uh, neoliberal entrepreneurship that I talk about, which is basically producing a particular form of knowledge about Iran that was marketable, still is marketable, during the so-called war on terror through these social media. And we see that today too. Of course, you know, we are not uh, no longer, you know, the whole thing of turquoise revolution freeing Iran through blogging never happened. Uh, and uh, we are in the age of Twitter and TikTok really these days. But uh, some of the slogans that we see in the protests outside of Iran and some in Iran that come through um, the uh, social media are extremely homophobic. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, it was said, because the Iranian state has been cutting off the internet, um, uh, most of what we see is people uh, or those who have resources to get uh, this out. And also, you know, through in Iran International, which is, uh, it's no secret that is uh, basically partially um, funded by the Saudi state or the Israeli media that have been very active these days. And 
So the homophobia that uh, makes the enemy beat Khamenei or the head of the Basij um, in Sharif University who was wearing a pink shirt and had hand movements that they all call, you know, all these groups called um, as a Eva um, Khohar or, uh, excuse my language, Kuni, the fag. So there is the fagification of enemy. So the enemy, the common enemy becomes Khamenei, Basij, Sepa, and so on and so forth and the queers. So it's kind of the queering, um, the, the, the enemy as uh, that who uh, deserve to die. Um, and these insults of calling them uh, fags is also in cartoons. Tukhanay Estani, who is a famous uh, Iranian cartoonist, had a um, cartoon of raping Khamenei through the Beit uh, uh, to uh, and underneath it was uh, the slogan, Nain Vari, Naun Vari, excuse my language again, Kiram to Pune Rahbari. So this is extremely um, homophobic, my dick in Khamenei's ass. So this kind of homophobic violence is enacted through these. And these are not the actual slogans of the legitimate protests of the Iranian people or Iranian women. They have been calling for woman life freedom. They haven't been calling for this kind of sexualized violence or you know this kind of homophobic uh, and heteronormative language that is used. Now I wanna say something about Negar Mortazavi because I know that um, there were calls even to this panel that why have you invited Negar Mortazavi? There is no more Negar Mortazavi here, but I think people, uh, um, not people, actually, it's a very um, uh, coordinated effort to shut down any kind of effort to um, lift a sanction. So Negar Mortazavi had a talk at the University of Chicago a couple of days ago. There was a coordinated, it was coordinated campaign to tweet sexist and uh, hateful posts about Negar calling her Patio Ridge and the Molaics and uh, so, you know, kind of whore uh, of a Mola and, and so on and so forth. Um, and in fact, there were 160,000 tweets about how Negar uh, works for the Islamic Republic, 50% of which were from inauthentic accounts. And these are the tech people who actually um, uh, analyze this. And they were created last month within uh, you know, with less than 10 followers. So these are actually fake accounts. And the tech people who have investigated this have shown that these are state actors behind them from the IP and not regular people. So you figure uh, where these might be coming from. These are state actors, um, you know, could be Israel or whatever, with endless resources and ordinary people see this massive circulation of tweets, 160,000 tweets, and assume that there is some truth behind these lies uh, and they join in. Uh, a friend was saying that her mom called and said, oh, do not talk to Negar Mortazavi because she's paid, uh, paid by the regime. This is an absolute lie. Negar Mortazavi and other women journalists who have been under attack are, uh, have, mm -hmm. have been, sorry, let me, uh, I'll finish this really quickly. She's a solid journalist who has worked with NPR, CNN, and uh, Independent and so on and so forth. But the only reason they're attacking her because in her Iran podcast, she has a very firm anti-sanctions position. And those of us who are familiar with the Zionist law, we know that these strategies um, are what they use all the time. So it started with uh, a video that Emily Schrader posted and went viral on Iranian Twitter as American journalist. She's not a journalist, she's a PR consultant who uh, uh, consults with the state of Israel. She transcribed her baseless accusations about Negar, Nayak, Elhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and published it then in Jerusalem Post. And that has become as if that is a fact that Negar, Mortazavi, or other people who advocate against um, or who advocate for the lifting of sanctions work with the Islamic Republic. I just had to say it once and for all that these are baseless accusations and consorted efforts and these, you know, all these trolls on the internet are trying to divert from the legitimate movement of the Iranian people. We should be talking about the Iranian women's movements, not about Negar Murtazavi and this and that, but they try to troll all these panels and I'm honestly sick and tired of it. I'm so sorry for taking so long, but I just had to say it. Thank you so much, Sima John. We have uh, five more minutes left. I think we are going to extend the panel to 6.10. Hopefully we can do that. So the three other panelists get a chance to respond to my question and we can have a short period of time for Q&A. If you see any Q&A, please pick that question and we can answer that. So um, Alzu John, it's uh, your turn. 
Yeah, I mean, thank you, Sima Jen, also for that. I think it's really important to talk about um, the way that the movement in Iran is actually being misconstrued and used for different means. Um, and individuals are being called out. There was a, a panel that was supposed to take place in Georgetown and it was canceled this morning for similar reasons. But, um, you know, I studied Iran's criminal justice system. And um, what was really striking to me is it's, it has a very, what, what I call an extreme victim rights content, which mean uh, component, which means that people have the right to forego retributive sanctioning or ask for it in crimes, including murder. And um, what when I was studying this, one thing I I got you know involved in was there's a veritable cottage industry. There's all these different groups, individuals, lawyers, social workers, even judges who are involved in trying to compel victims of murder, their family members, to forego retributive sanctioning. That doesn't mean that people don't go to jail or don't pay. It just means they're spared eye for an eye retribution. And what, what struck me was that the people who are involved in this, many of them are anti-death penalty activists. And they didn't necessarily start that way. Um, and you can read my book, it, it is a long discussion about it. But over the years of looking at the injustice of the death penalty, they actually themselves became against the death penalty. And yet we all know that death penalty activists are thrown in jail, like Atina Daemi, whereas these forgiveness workers, as I call them in my book, they're actually not just allowed to do what they want, but they're celebrated. And I was thinking a lot about that and the, this, how this cottage industry exists. And I think one of the things that I wanted to touch on is how this actually translates into what Asif Bayat has called a social non-movement. And I think that we're so used to looking at social movements from you know, the West and thinking, well, the conditions are, are such that they are, but we need to think about the different conditions and what the conditions of possibility are in an authoritarian context. And um, Bayat talks about these non-collective actors who are engaged in collective action, advancing interests of the marginalized, the subordinated, and he sees this in passive networks, street politics. But I also want to bring forth the work of Alexei Yurchek, who wrote about the fall of the Soviet Union in a beautiful book called Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. And he talks about the sudden but completely expected fall of the Soviet Union, uh, unsurprising, he calls it, fall. And he says, in, I mean, in, this, in his book, he explores these new and unanticipated communities, ideals, relations, what we might call horizontal organizing that enable later transformations to take place and to appear both unanticipated yet unsurprising. And I, in my, in my research, I noticed that there's a very, very active, for instance, documentary theater world in Iran, uh, um, Mustanad where they place issues that you couldn't otherwise just talk about in literally before the eyes of the state. And they have been very active in, in I would say, making, making sure that they change some minds. Um, and then just the, that's just one example and I'm trying to be fast, but the last thing I'll just say is that um, in the meeting with ex-political prisoners, I was very shocked. I was, a, a lawyer called me up, a defense lawyer called me up and said, get in the car, we're gonna go somewhere. We went to Kadaj outside of, you know, the farms outside and so many famous ex-political prisoners were there and they were in, there in honor of someone who was on furlough and the thing that really shocked me was how forbearing they were in their demeanor and how they had every opportunity in this closed meeting to say all the things that we're hearing on Twitter and whatnot. But what, they, what this person really focused on was the economic difficulties and how, look, the soldiers, 
the, the prison wardens, like they're just human beings trying to get by in life and we can't have hatred in our hearts for them. We have to treat them with the compassion, with the mercy that we wish that we could see more of in society. And ultimately what he talked about was incremental change. Anyway, you can read the book hopefully and you can see that there, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Roxana, it's your turn. Well, I'll try to make it very quick. Um, you asked about academic citizenship. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the term uh, is coined more, very recently, although the concept is not um, uh, new. And here I'd like to um, point out the ex excellent author Amelia uh, Soa, who worked on um, Israel and uh, the projects of uh, women's empowerment. Uh, in the context of um, neoliberal economic policy. So I think that uh, in a way um, defines what we mean by economic citizenship, as well as um, it gives me an entry to what my research has been. Um, international human right has two aspects, has legal, uh, sorry, civil right and socioeconomic rights. And the issue of civil rights Veil, uh, Islamic Sharia law, that's, uh, that falls within the civic, um, uh, civic rights. And that is uh, very much what has been seen. And what we, what's being analyzed is more focused on civil rights and women's um, um, rejection of compulsory dress code. And not so much on socioeconomic rights, partly because it touches upon uh, how countries of the world have been forced or have been um, inclined to incorporate a neoliberal economic policy. Uh, and this ne neoliberal economic policy means that the state has to reduce its social services. State shrinks and it's no longer responsible to provide social services for its citizens. And, the, and then what has to then take care of poverty and inequality are all the other, um, other actors like social networks or uh, religious groups. And I think that's very interesting and very, very important. Now, Amalia Saad uh, talks about how uh, reduction of the uh, welfare state has led on the one hand uh, leaving women for self-support uh, and uh, other um, other actors are, who are to empower women uh, economically. Uh, she also also talks about uh, apolitical conservatism, and I think that's a very interesting point that takes me to my uh, last book, which uh, in which I. Uh, interviewed extensively, uh, many women who were uh, engaged in the uh, social safety network, some of whom were highly pious religious. And I just want to say something that will probably lighten up the mood of the panel that I was talking to um, someone, um, some of the mothers who are extremely um, disturbed by the role of satellite TV. Um, how their young women are just consumed by these images of soap operas and how it is cool for girls that, that they reach the age of 16, they should not be virgin anymore. And that how that creates anxiety and that anger and uh, that how older women are able to cope with these uh, younger women. And that takes us to, I think, something that um, uh, heard a, a while ago uh, when I was interviewing uh, somebody from the Peace, Peace Institute that said that the fall of the Soviet Union um, was partly due to, um, to distribution of films and soap operas. Um, so I think that um, it's interesting to focus on how um, women's socioeconomic um, status is affected. Um, and kind of, yes, a veil is important, but honestly, I have 
um, spent two decades traveling throughout Iran, mainly in the poor neighborhood, Zahedan, uh, Sanandaj, really with poor women. And honestly, wearing hijab or not hijab is not their issue. Their issue is being able to put food on the table, being able to have access to medication, which of course sanctions undercut. So does government embracement of neoliberal economic policy, corruption and all that. Uh, so it's, um, it's very complicated. So I, I was, I'll stop there, it should be calm. Thank you so much, uh, Roxana John. And uh, uh, Wendy, it's your turn. We have um, five more minutes left, and we could extend to six fifteen our panel, so we get a chance to answer a few questions. So um, Wendy, it's your turn, Doctor. Um... Um, I, I think it might be better if we could get some questions. So I'm happy to yield my time to the Q&A. Is that all right with everyone? Yes, of course. Okay. So if you could raise any question for each other, if you would like to address any questions, uh, please go for it. Anyone would like to answer any questions? Can I just very quickly, because this question, uh, even though I keep sending the link to my article, they keep asking, medicine is exempt from the sanctions, and why do you say that, uh, you know, or was your sister's uh, death because of the sanctions? My sister um, got cancer, like many women in Iran, uh, for many reasons, but I just want to say a couple of things, that yes, the sanctions um, devastated the Iranian um, economy, but they also hurt the environment greatly because uh, uh, when Iran could not uh, basically um, uh, use the equipment or send its oil to be refined, they created their homegrown, and I'm not making this up, there are articles, you can look at the article that I wrote and the links to actually studies that have been done, um, and they created their own homegrown uh, industries to refine oil, which meant that the uh, petroleum that uh, is produced uh, by the Iranian state contains 10 to 800 times more carcinogen, uh, carcin carcinogenic toxins than the uh, international standard. So that is why the rate of cancer is really high in Iran right now. And, um, access to uh, chemotherapy. If you have any family member, of, if you know anyone in Iran who has cancer, you know that it's near impossible to get uh, effective um, chemo medicine. And yes, uh, uh, on the paper, it's supposed to be exempt, but all these pharmaceutical companies need to make financial transactions with Bank of Merkazi, the central bank of Iran, and there are sanctions on central uh, bank of Iran. So uh, no one will actually trade with uh, Iran, despite the medicine uh, on the paper uh, being as exempt. And this is again, uh, the subject of many studies, and you can go and do your research and find out about it. And that is why exactly as Wendy said, so many people died because of lack of access, uh, not just to the vaccines. And yes, Khomeini uh, said that. I'm not defending Khomeini when I say this. So there should be space for in-between position to critique both the US sanctions and the Iranian state's mismanagement of economy, mismanagement of distribution of resources, including medicine. And so when I, uh, yes, Khamenei said all that about uh, vaccines, we don't uh, get vaccines from the US or whatnot, but that is not the reason that vaccine, uh, vaccines did not go to Iran. The sanctions prevented uh, medicine from going to Iran. My nieces, both of them are doctors in Iran, and both of them were complaining about how the equipment, the tubes that uh, during the COVID they had to put in people's mouths, they, there is a shortage. So, so rather than they're supposed to be disposable, they were, they had to wash them so that they could use them again. And that increased uh, the, uh, the contamination. Uh, so, you know, again, I sent the link, but I just wanted to clarify that um, that is the reason, despite it being on the paper, because financial 
transactions undone, are done through Bank America Z, and there is uh, there are sanctions on that. Uh, that means that um, medical equipment and medicine cannot go to Iran. If I can just piggyback on that point too, just to reiterate that um, currency devaluation in Iran has been at the highest it's ever been, and that is a direct result of unilateral U.S. unilateral sanctions. And so I think it's really important to remember that you know, we're having these discussions, many people, their perception of sanctions is that it's going to hurt the government and it doesn't. Um, these are people who have millions and sometimes billions of dollars in European bank accounts and they're gonna be just fine. So we need to re remember that sanctions are affecting ordinary Iranians and this is not a Nyack paid uh, <laughs> advertisement. This is reality if you talk to people in Iran. Wonderful. Anyone else wants to answer to some of the questions? Well, I just wanted to uh, again piggyback on what Wendy was saying that, um, you know, we know uh, that sanctions hurt people. I mean, in the case of Iraq, 5,000 children were uh, killed as a result of sanctions. So really, women and children are paying the price of sanctions. And that just goes over the head and we, we don't talk about it. We have a few more minutes left. And if you wish to, Nazanin, would you like to ask? Um, yeah, I saw one question that was about the class uh, composition of the movement. And I thought it's getting lost in the, in, 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 in the very important discussion that we are having. So I thought of addressing that. Um, in response to the question about what's the class nature of this, this movement, I think if we compare it to previous movements, the Green Movement, for example, in 2009 was known as, you know, reformist oriented, mostly middle class um, uh, 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 movement happening in larger cities. And then the Oban uh, protests that followed after that, the class composition of movements sort of changed. So the Oban movements were uh, the protests were all uh, were mostly uh, working class um, uh, protesters. And then after that, um, the protests on food stamps and food prices and all that, they've all had some kind of limited um, working class uh, position or limited class composition. What's very significant about the recent protests is that it cuts across not only gender, ethnicity, or um, but also class boundaries. What we've seen is geographical diversity. So the protests have taken place in large cities like Tehran, but also very, very small cities. Um, we've also seen now in recent days, in, in, especially past week, we've seen uh, workers going on strike and um, they've, uh, they've issued statements. We've also seen teachers' contribution um, to, the, um, to the protests and um, issuing statements. So there are various kind of um, classes involved. I just wanted to highlight that. There is a wonderful question by Persis Karim as well. I just want, uh, she's asking if uh, there's any organized movements inside Iran or anywhere in terms of kind of charting women's rights. Not that I've heard of, maybe my other colleagues who are also connected to Iran or here. Um, that was actually what I was trying to allude to when I presented my initial comments that I think there is a lack of organization in the sense of, and also what I said was it's sort of clear what uh, women are um, running away from, but what they're running towards is not yet clear. And maybe this is what the protests are just the beginning. Uh, groups will form, Iranians uh, have always shown that there's vibrancy in civil society and among the activists, but also because Persis John is also outside and you know, in recently I've, I've accepted finally that I'm part of the diaspora now. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is also something that we can kind of build bridges and um, contribute to. We need more of uh, more discussions to kind of figure out what is this vision of a, uh, of a future era. Can I just say, add something to what Nazanin has just said. When there was a 1 million, the campaign for 1 million signature, I was in Iran, I was doing field work. And I was witness to several underground meetings that women were holding, holding throughout um, mainly middle class. Uh, there were two issues uh, that uh, that campaign didn't take off. One was that um, it didn't really reach out to um, low income families. That was one issue. The second issue was that it was taken up by women feminists outside of Iran. So it became 
a, a point of, um, it became something that the regime had to clamp down because it was picked up outside of Iran. Left to its own, it would have been able to mobilize and it would have been able to create a network within uh, women inside the country. But these two factors, the lack of, it's, it's the, the fact that it was mainly middle-class urban women um, uh, initiative. And two, like you, you know, we have this female journalist who is saying hijab is first step to overthrow the regime. So when somebody says that, who is very close to the, um, former CIA uh, or you know other um, powerful uh, groups that in are in conflict with Iran. When somebody says that, then anybody who wants to um, protest against a compulsory dress code, then it gets put in a very difficult. It, it gets cornered. So you are with that female journalist who is in the pockets of the country, the superpower country who wants to fight, who wants a, a regime overthrow. Um, so these are, um, these are some of the complexities that we're dealing with. That's fantastic. And it shows that we have a lot to discuss and to think about, you know, potential futurity, feminist futurity. So which would require way more discussions and in between positions and complex positions. We have one more minute. If you want to say something um, at the end, we do that and we have to stop. Thank you so much for your patience for staying here until 6.20. We, we would like to, to stop at 6.20 exactly. So we have it two minutes for your last comments. Anyone else would like to address? Can I just say something about the part of the question that because I got so heated, didn't respond and that was the 80s generation. I think um, there is this kind of discourse of that this generation is so different than other generations, kind of as if this movement is new. And uh, as many people on the panel have said, uh, what we see now is a culmination of years of struggle and activism and scholarship of uh, Iranian women in Iran. And uh, what you referred to, uh, Minuj, on the 80s, I think you were referring to a BBC show where three um, 80s uh, uh, generation, so-called 80s generation from outside of Iran, were talking about how uh, Sakui, Saida Sakui, is their hero, a royalist, or that that someone actually people make fun of in Iran, um, or uh, that um, uh, people shouldn't. Four people in the corner are saying uh, we don't want uh, uh, neither to uh, down with the dictator, whether it is uh, Shah or the Rahbar or you know the leader. So people are basically saying that in between position that we neither want this nor want this. We want an independent movement. We want councils to decide our own uh, future. And those voices are not heard through this mainstream uh, media. And I think uh, it's a mistake to assume that there is a representation of 80s generation uh, wants this or not. There are so many contradictions within Iran, within the protests, within the movements. And I think a productive way of approaching it would be to listen to all these contradictions rather than trying to complete them and reduce it to an either or position. And that's, you know, I think my last words. On that wonderful note, we need to conclude our panel. And thank you so much for your wonderful, thoughtful conversation and intervention. And this, this shows that actually we need many more panels and many more discussions uh, to have an understanding which is going beyond this either or position, which is polarizing Iranian uh, opposition or Iranian critical voices, and it's now going for silencing them in a very aggressive way. And also, I think it's really interesting that when we talk about, we have been talking about intersectionality and so on for many years now, but when it comes to Iran, we start to homogenizing everything and everybody as one group. And thank you so much for really um, 
uh, elaborating on the question of class and local differences and rural urban and so on. So thanks a lot. We need to conclude. Um, wonderful having you on the panel and I look forward to more conversations and more exchanges. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you.